I start by apologising for my slightly hirsute appearance this evening. As Greg says, the, the beard and the hair have been growing since the beginning of lockdown. If you've seen the, the photo that Greg asked me to send of myself, the, the hair is long, but it's certainly not this long. And while there is a beard, it's certainly not quite as fulsome as this. However, I think my current look is possibly something like an Old Testament prophet. And I think that's an appropriate place to start this evening. If we can go back to say five, six centuries before the Church of Christ, at a time when the prophets were active, and listen to the words that they were saying to Israel, that will set the scene for what I want to say tonight. And I'd like to begin, if I may, with some words that the prophet Jeremiah spoke. He said, take up weeping and wailing for the mountains and a lamentation for the pastures of the wilderness because they are laid waste so that no one passes through and the lowing of cattle is not heard. Both the birds of the air and the beasts have fled and are gone. I will make Jerusalem a heap of ruins, a lair of jackals, and I will make the cities of Judah a desolation without inhabitant. Around 605 BC, Jeremiah uttered this prophecy of Judah's devastation at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. And about 18 years later, this prophecy came to pass. Towns were destroyed, villages were shattered, and Jerusalem fell to King Nebuchadnezzar. The temple was burnt, and the city was reduced to little more than ruins. The inhabitants of Jerusalem were taken back to Babylon. Now, this was not the first time that the armies of Nebuchadnezzar had deported the Judeans to Babylon. A first wave had been taken about a decade before. The Israelites' new home in Babylon was the capital of the Chaldean Empire. From about 626 to 539 BC, the Chaldean Empire ruled huge swathes of the Middle East. And it was here, as I say, that a significant part of the population of Judea was taken following the fall of Jerusalem, and it remained there for decades until they were permitted to return. And yet, after they were taken into exile, Jeremiah sends the captives a letter which exhorts them to settle down in their new land, to continue living, to flourish. Thus, says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters, multiply there and do not decrease but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf. For in its welfare, you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let your prophets and your diviners who are, who are among you deceive you and do not listen to the dreams which they dream. For it is a lie which they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, says the Lord. But thus, says the Lord, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will hear you. You will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes, gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. The message to the exiles is overwhelmingly positive. God says, I know the plans I have for you, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And this positive message of the exile's return is found again in the book of Baruch. 
Baruch, of course, was Jeremiah's secretary who recorded his prophecies. And in that book, we find this marvelously uplifting prophecy predicting the return of the exiles. Arise, O Jerusalem, stand upon the height and look toward the east and see your children gathered from west and east at the word of the Holy One, rejoicing that God has remembered them. For they went forth from you on foot, led away by their enemies, but God will bring them back to you, carried in glory as on a royal throne. For God has ordered that every high mountain and the everlasting hills be made low, and the valleys filled up, to make level ground, so that Israel may walk safely in the glory of God. The woods and every fragrant tree have shaded Israel at God's command, for God will lead Israel with joy in the light of his glory, with the mercy and righteousness that comes from him. Now the historic Babylon was located in what is today Iraq. If we move forwards by about 500 years, a Christian community was formed on the Nineveh Plains in the northern part of the country around that time, probably within decades of the death of Jesus, but certainly no later than the early second century. According to one tradition, it was St Thomas the Apostle who brought the faith to the Nineveh Plains, and there is some evidence to support this. In 1964, while the restoration was being carried out in the Church of St Thomas in Mosul, Mosul being one of the major cities in northern Iraq, the finger bones of St Thomas were discovered in a compartment in one of the walls. They had probably been in the same place since the new church on the site was built in the 1200s. And when you think about the significance of these relics, these may well be the very fingers that touched the wounds of our Lord in the upper room. Just think about that, how significant these relics are. The very relics that may have touched the side of Christ, the very relics that may have placed their fingers on the wounds within his hands. Now these relics were housed in the church there, even after they'd been discovered in the wall, until the middle of 2014. And then in June 2014, the city of Mosul fell. The extremist Islamist militias group, variously known as the Esh or ISIS or the Islamic State, seized the city. Many Christians left, among them Syriac Orthodox Archbishop Nicodemus Sharaf, who took with him the church's most precious relics, the finger bones of St. Thomas, Thomas the Apostle. Now for those who remained there, life was not easy. In Mosul, the homes of the Christians who stayed were daubed with the Arabic symbol Nun, meaning Nazarene, indicating that these were Christian houses. At first, Mosul's Christians were offered the option of staying on the condition that they paid the Islamic jizya tax. The jizya tax is a payment that historically non-Muslims had to make in Islamic countries. It's been obsolete for centuries, but Daesh revived it in the areas under their control. But when the time came, Christians were told by the Islamist extremists to convert, or in the words of one Daesh officer, there is nothing for you but the sword. And so the Christians fled. This time the Christians leaving the city were stopped as they reached its edges. They were forced to hand over all the possessions they were trying to take with them. They were deprived of everything. In one case, the soldiers even took the batteries from a child's hearing aid. One man who fled Mosul told us how his neighbours went into his house, found his savings, kept half and gave the other half to Daesh. Then the man texted the Christian who had fled to let him know what he'd done. During their time in possession of Mosul and the surrounding area, Daesh proceeded to raise a number of the region's religious sites, 
including the historic St Elijah's Monastery, which was near Mosul. Although the monks had long left, the 6th century monastery was still a place of pilgrimage, attracting Christians from the local area. Ceremonies were still held there at least twice in the church's calendar. Today, the monastery of St Elijah has completely gone. The building no longer stands and virtually nothing remains of its foundations. Daesh raised the historic building, a symbol of the Christian presence in the region from early times to the ground. Daesh also publicly burned Bibles and other Christian books in Mosul. But to put things into perspective, life was not easy for anyone in Mosul under Daesh. Public executions became the norm, and according to reports, 19 women were reportedly executed for refusing to sleep with Daesh fighters. As that summer rolled on, Daesh extended its reach throughout Iraq's Nineveh plains, which fly to the north and to the east of Mosul. Along with Yazidis, Mandeans, and members of other minority groups, not to mention numerous Muslims, particularly Shia Muslims, but Sunni Muslims as well, Christians became part of a mass exodus that saw more than 500,000 people forced to flee their homes. Among these were around 120,000 Christians, which represented at least a third of the country's total Christian population at the time. 120,000. So more than a fifth of the exodus and at least a third of the total Christian population in the whole of Iraq. The vast majority of Christians who fled sought sanctuary in Erbil, particularly Ankawa, a largely Christian district of the Kurdish capital, where there is a major shrine to Our Lady. Others made their way to Dahuk in the north, while others left the country altogether. Those that were unable to flee or weren't able to get away quickly enough, related his horrific stories in the days after their, their liberation. 16-year-old Ismail and his 55-year-old widowed mother, Jandak Nasi, were captured by Daesh after the extremists seized Bartella, which is one of the villages on the Nineveh Plains. When they were finally freed from Daesh and in fact were living in Erbil, they told us their story. They were told by the Daesh fighters that they had to convert to Islam, and initially they refused to renounce their Christian faith. Ismail was eventually thrown in jail for refusing to convert. But his ordeal behind bars made him fear for his life, and moreover, fear for the life of his mother. He told us, one day a Shia Muslim was shot right in front of me. The terrorists told me, if you do not convert to Islam, we will shoot you as well. That is when I converted to Islam. From that time on, we concealed that we were Christians. And when Ismail said that they shot the Shia Muslim in front of him, what he means is that they killed the Muslim in front of him. Now, to all appearances, Ismail and his mother were living as Muslims and they were taken to Mosul where they saw numerous horrors. Ismail reported witnessing seeing children execute groups of prisoners as part of the daily executions that occurred there. But despite having outwardly converted, despite seeming to have changed their faiths, secretly they clung to their Christian beliefs. But, as Ismail told us, then the Daesh warriors found my necklace with a cross, a sign that I am a Christian, the jihadists beat me, and I had to study the Quran for a month. I was hit whenever I could not answer their questions the way they wanted me to. His mother, Jandak Nasi, was prodded with long needles when she could not correctly answer questions about the Islamic faith. But during the Battle of Mosul, they found their chance, and they ran from the city. Daesh snipers saw them trying to flee, and they shot at them, but they took shelter in a ruined house on the outskirts. After several hours, the forces liberating Mosul arrived and they were able to leave the house waving a white flag and they were taken by the soldiers. 
Eventually they told them their story. They were sent to Erbil where they were looked after. Others who were captured as they tried to flee the advance of Daesh on the Nineveh Plains suffered in different ways. A number of women were forced into sexual slavery. This was far more common in the case of Yazidi women, but there were numerous cases of Christian women ended up suffering systematic, repeated sexual violence at the hand of hands of Daesh. Children were also forcibly removed from their own families and usually placed with members of Daesh. In Karakwash, which before it fell to Daesh was the last Christian majority town in Iraq, saw both of these horrors happening to its inhabitants. But lest all of this seem too grim, I will relate two stories that had happy endings. Rita Habib was one of the Christian women abducted from Karakwash, who was forced into sexual slavery, but she was finally freed and reunited with her father two years ago. She was returned to Karakwash, and I believe the family is still living there. She described her ordeal thus, I was bought and sold four times. They did evil things to us. They beat us and raped us. The worst of all was the girls age nine who were raped. But despite her horrific ordeal, there was an end to it. She was freed from Daesh. She has been reunited with her family and her life continues. Something similar happened in the case of Christina Abada in terms of her gaining her freedom. Um, Christina Abada was one of the children who was forcibly taken from her parents and placed with an extremist family. She was taken when she was just free, but three years later, she was reunited with her parents. Again, many of these stories, while deeply tragic, deeply moving, have happy endings. Now, as I said, the vast majority of Christians sought sanctuary in Erbil. When the first refugees arrived, a synod of the Chaldean church was in session. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with the Chaldean church, it's one of the Eastern Catholic churches. These are churches which maintain their own liturgy, which have their own patrimony, but are nevertheless in full communion with the Pope. The Chaldean Synod quickly turned its attention to the question of how to help the Christians who had arrived on their doorstep. A representative from Age of the Church in Need, the charity I work for, was present at the Synod meeting and we quickly pledged to support their aid efforts. Indeed, Age of the Church in Need, I am proud to say, was the single largest contributor to the aid efforts, providing somewhere around 40% of the total funding for what was a mammoth aid operation. The Chaldean Church worked very closely alongside other Christian communities, such as the Syriac Orthodox and the Syriac Catholic Churches, ensuring that aid was provided to everyone who needed it. And this included members of other religious groups who turned to the church for help. The Chaldean Church also found temporary housing for those who initially were sleeping rough, whether that's in parks, under bridges, or even in a number of cases on the roadside. About a month after the first displaced family arrived in Erbil, the UN turned up and provided tents and some other equipments for the Chaldean Church's outreach to the displaced. This help from the UN was the first, last, and only significant international aid that was received. No aid was received from the Iraqi government, even though the cost of supporting the refugees over three years amounted to more than 35 million US dollars. Archbishop Bashar Warder, who oversaw the provision of emergency aid in Erbil, was outraged by the fact that Iraq's national government in Baghdad did nothing for those seeking shelter in the Kurdish capital, which included, as I said, the majority of Nineveh, the Nineveh Plains displaced Christians. He said, the reality is that Christians have received no support from the central government. They have done nothing for them, absolutely nothing. The government in Baghdad received a lot of help from the international community for the displaced people from Mosul and Nineveh, but there has been no sign of it here. 
Indeed, the vast majority of the aid for these internal refugees, more than 99%, came from Christian charities and organisations. Although the governments of Poland and Hungary should get honourable mentions for their support. And I mentioned earlier how aid to the church in need had been involved. But the feeling among Iraq's Christians was that most of the world had turned its back on them. Of course, the Chaldean church did everything it could to ensure that the refugees could flourish in their new homes. It tried to ensure that life went on as usually as possible, despite the very unusual situation the internal refugees found themselves in. Schools were set up for the refugee children, a project that we at Age of the Church in Need were very heavily involved in. Archbishop Warder told us, we are especially grateful for your help for the students in building five schools for them in our Archdiocese, the Chaldean Archdiocese of Erbil, which we completed in the city of Ankawa on land owned by our Archdiocese. Two of the five schools are consequently being used for about 1,100 students aged 18 to 25 who were forced to flee, including not only Christians, but also Muslims and Yazidis. The schools were built from prefabricated units and in all about 7,200, mainly Christian, but also children from other faiths were taught in eight schools. Three of these were outside of Erbil, including one in Dehok in the north, which was run by the Syriac Orthodox Church. The children were taught by teachers who had fled the Christian towns and villages seized by Daesh, and the central government in Baghdad did pay for the teaching staff, as these were effectively the equivalent of church-administered state schools. So that was a legal responsibility, and the central government did honour that. And the classrooms were not only used for schooling, but also for catechetical classes, and other activities with the young refugees. Now, I'd like to suggest that this picture of life flourishing in Erbil brings us back to the picture of life in Erbil, oh, sorry, it takes us back to the picture of life in exile in Babylon that Jeremiah presented us with earlier. The biblical image of a faith community flourishing in exile is one that I think has real resonances with the situation in Iraq. Those who had been forced to flee their homes on the Nineveh Plains I think we're in an analogous situation. Let's recap just some of the words that were written to the biblical exiles. Thus, says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, build houses and live in them, plant gardens and eat their produce, take wives and have sons and daughters, Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters and multiply there. And I'll quickly add as an aside, there were weddings that did go on. Even when they were in the tented camps initially, uh, marriages were still being held, still being organised and still being celebrated. Jeremiah's message went on. For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil to give you a future and a hope. This passage ends on a note of hope, and for all that they have suffered, for all that they have endured, many of the Iraqi Christians in exile displayed not a sense of despair, but a sense of hope. One family seeking shelter in Erbil, who had been driven out of their homes on the Nineveh Plains, and at that time depended on the local church for absolutely everything, were asked by one of my colleagues when they visited them, do you have hope? And one member of the family replied almost incredulously, of course we have hope. We are Christians. We have hope in Jesus. Jim Shannon is the Ulster Unionist MP for Strangford in Northern Ireland. He's also the chair of the all-party parliamentary group for freedom of religion or belief. And he accompanied one of Aid to the Church in Needs project trips to Erbil to see the work that was being done there. It was just a couple of years after the initial exodus. And by that time, most of the families that had not been housed in flats had been moved into small prefabricated units, a bit like those we built the schools from. Mr. Shannon visited a number of families and was struck by the divine mercy image that he saw in living unit after living unit. 
What struck him most was the legend written along the bottom, Jesus, I trust in you. And for whatever reason, the images that they had up in their living units in Erbil had the message both in Arabic and in English. So an English speaking visitor just at a glance could see the words, Jesus, I trust in you. And for whatever reason, it seemed the image of divine mercy found a particular resonance with Iraq's exiles. And the message of trusting God in that situation of adversity was something that struck Jim Shannon very deeply. Here are thousands of families. The life that they used to know has been taken away from them. If they were able to take any possessions with them when they left, it was no more than they could get into a suitcase. They are dependent on the church for everything. Food, water, electricity, housing, everything. And yet on the walls of their living units, they are displaying an image that speaks of trust in Jesus, of trust in the incarnate God in the midst of uncertainty. And we are having this meeting here tonight because it's the year of the word, because we're being called to look at the scriptures more deeply. So let's recall the words written to the Hebrew converts to Christianity back in the first century. The author of the letter to the Hebrews encouraged them thus. Let us hold fast then by the faith we profess. We can claim a great high priest and one who has passed right up through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. It is not as if our high priest was incapable of feeling for us and our humiliations. He has been through every trial, fashioned as we are, only sinless. Let us come boldly then before the throne of grace to meet with mercy and win that grace which will help us in our needs. The incarnate Son of God, the word of God proceeding from the Father's innermost essence, who took human form to himself and was born as a man, has been through human trials, he has shared in the sufferings of humanity. Though Jesus was in the form of God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, a thing to be clung to, a thing to be retained. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. Those, of course, are the words from Philippians chapter 2, which are also found in Vespers on Saturday in the Divine Office. These words remind us that the God who suffers on the cross for the sake of a world is the God who is able to understand the deepest needs, the sharpest pain of a suffering humanity. Indeed, one can take this view further, for the church is Christ's body, and if one part is suffering, all the rest suffer with it. As Jesus made clear to Paul on the road to Damascus, if the body suffers, the head suffers too. That radical message that Jesus had for Paul is still relevant today. When the body of Christ is persecuted, Jesus himself is persecuted. When the body of Christ suffers, Jesus himself suffers. Let us not overlook the scriptural context for this incident. Paul had been arrested those who believed in Jesus. And when he sees the light from heaven and hears the voice speaking to him, he quite naturally asks, who are you, Lord? And he received the reply, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. I don't think it is fanciful to suggest that Paul's view of all Christians as part of Christ's mystical body is rooted in this experience. An experience during which Jesus radically identified himself with his suffering people. God is not distant from the pain and the anguish endured by Iraq's exiles. The God who took humanity continues to be intimately related to humanity and to share its sufferings. It is not novel to suggest that because the body suffers, so does its head, that when Iraq's Christians suffer, so Christ shares in their sufferings. In all their pain, in all their trials, in all their sorrow, God is there with them. But to Esh's seizure of the Nineveh Plains, 
is just the latest chapter in the devastation of Iraq's minorities. Before 2003, Iraqi Christians in the country numbered around 1.4 million. Today, there are probably fewer than 250,000 left. The impact of Daesh's genocidal campaign cannot be underestimated, but the fall in the number of Christians has been accelerated by ongoing targeted attacks on these communities by Islamists and not just by Daesh. Such attacks massively intensified following the 2003 invasion of Iraq. Christians in the south of the country suddenly found themselves targets for extremist groups who have been kept under control by Saddam Hussein's regime. At the end of October 2010, Our Lady of Deliverance Syriac Catholic Church in Baghdad was attacked by jihadists during the Sunday evening service. They began killing worshippers. When Iraqi military later stormed the church, the jihadists blew themselves up. They had all been wearing suicide vests. 58 people were killed and 78 were wounded. Several months after the attack, I was privileged to speak to two of the survivors. Two young women whose father George had been killed in the attack. Their father George was one of the 58 martyrs who lost his life when the extremists attacked. The younger of the two sisters, Simone, had been in the church right up until the end of the attack and she was one of the 78 who was wounded. She subsequently had to be flown to France for emergency medical treatment. And Simone described experiencing nightmares for months after the events. But despite the terrible events of that evening, her faith remained undimmed. She told me Jesus was crying with us when we were attacked. In all their pain, in all their trials, in all their sorrow, God is there with them. And they know this. Simone was the one that told me that Jesus had been crying with them during that terrible attack. Today, the picture for Iraq's Christian community, the majority of which is in northern Iraq, is a mixed one. Following the defeat of Daesh, towns and villages were cleared of the extremists, and a long process began, which still hasn't finished, of clearing the bombs which had been left behind and rebuilding the houses and churches that had been destroyed. The rebuilding still goes on. But due to a concerted effort by the churches, Christians have been able to start returning to their old towns, to their old lives. In March 2017, the Chaldean, Syriac Orthodox and Syriac Catholic churches came together in an unprecedented ecumenical gesture, I think partly shaped by the close cooperation which they'd experienced during their time as exiles, and they formed the Nineveh Reconstruction Committee. They came together as one to help rebuild those Christian towns and villages. And it's a project that Aid to the Church in Need was very heavily involved with in its initial stages. Because the churches were worried that if they didn't act decisively, then the Christian presence on the Nineveh Plains would disappear or be reduced to a mere token presence. So they pledged to work together to rebuild, so that the displaced Christian families that wanted to could go home, so that they wouldn't lose heart and that Iraq's Christians, like its Jewish community, wouldn't end up just as a distant memory. Today, around 45% of the families that fled in 2014 have returned to their old towns and villages. They have resumed their lives and they are beginning to flourish once more in the towns and villages that have been homes to Christians for centuries. But that does mean that around half have not returned. Many still want to go back, they're planning to go back, but they're waiting for their homes to be rebuilt. Around 45% of the homes registered to be restored are still awaiting reconstruction or still undergoing reconstruction. The Nineveh Reconstruction Committee started with the homes it was easiest to rebuild and those that had suffered more substantial damage, more substantial issues in some cases, parts of them have been completely blown up under Daesh occupation. These are the ones which the committee is still working on rebuilding. But as I say, 
others are not so certain. Security remains an ongoing concern, even among those who have returned. There are reports that local militia groups, particularly the two Iranian-backed militias operating in the Nineveh Plains, that's the Shabak militia and the Babylon Brigade, have harassed and intimidated Christians. These militias are allowed to operate with the permission of the national Iraqi government because they were key in getting rid of Daesh during the final push. But security is an issue and there are worries that the Iranian-based militias are not helping. Unemployment's also a concern. There are schemes to generate jobs, but there's no by, by no means full, full employment. Financial concerns are there. Administrative corruption across the region is a concern. Religious discrimination is a worry. And there is ongoing uncertainty in the face of disputes between the central government in Baghdad and the Kurdistan regional government over the administration of the Nineveh Plains. It is a disputed area. However, having lived as exiles, many have been able to return to their old lives. Despite ongoing challenges, there have been echoes of that glorious vision of God bringing his people back to their homes that we saw in the prophets. There is the possibility of a future for Iraq's minorities on the Nineveh Plains, including its Christian community, which, as I said right back at the beginning, has ancient roots in the region. And there is hope for a future. An echo again of that prophecy of Jeremiah's, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. And I would like to end with the words of Simone, who was caught up in the attack on Our Lady of Salvation Church, and whose father George, as I said, was one of those who was martyred. Despite all that she had endured, I remember her saying, we have hope in God's love. Hope is a living reality for so many of the region's Christians, and indeed for so many Christians around the world who are persecuted for their faith. There is a hope that is deep, that is real, and that I actually think is surprising. But God, I think, does surprise us with the things that he can do in people's lives. Just like to leave you with her words, that message of hope, we have hope in God's love. All right, thanks, thanks uh, so much for that, John. Um, and as we just re reflect, um, particularly on those, uh, those last words and um, perhaps um can invite anybody anybody who does uh have a question for john uh following the talk just just to share that question with us just 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 in the chat uh just just to remind everybody that's just to uh, click the little button with the question mark uh, at the bottom um uh, th then you can access the chat you can just just uh type any questions or or, or comments for john uh, into into that little box down there, and and I'll I'll, I'll read those out if anybody uh, has any. Um, perhaps just a uh, um, uh, a factual question, which which people might might have whilst whilst they come up with their, their own questions, John. Um, just wondering how um, obviously we we're, we're, we were hoping to have to have gathered in uh, uh, Hinsley Hall tonight. Um, in in Leeds and, and we're not able to, to, to meet together um, in, in person. Um, how is the, the, the situation with, with COVID um, affecting the, the, the lives of, of, uh, of those Christians? Um, well, I, I, perhaps both, both those who have um, been able to return to the, uh, their homes in the Nineveh Plain and, and those other Christians who've maybe been, been dispersed to, to, to other parts of the, the country. The problems in the Nineveh Plains um, for, for COVID aren't actually that great. Uh, the number of cases have been very isolated. I think the reason for this is that the Nineveh Plains is basically a patchwork of towns and villages. Um, you can have a, a, a sort of Syriac Orthodox town next to a Syriac Catholic town, then next door to that you can have a Yazidi village, next to that there's a Mandean village. Um, and some of the communities, why, why there is great interaction 
and they're, they're by no means there's animosity between the, the different villages and different communities. Uh, they do to a large degree traditionally tend to keep to themselves, um, which doesn't mean they're necessarily insular, but that does mean they're a bit more isolated in their everyday lives. And I think because of this unique geography of the Nineveh Plains, that's one reason why we haven't seen so far um, particular problems with the spread of COVID um, and particular issues with the coronavirus affecting people, um, which isn't to say that there haven't been cases, um, but those cases which there have been have been isolated fairly quickly uh, and it hasn't really got out of proportion or out of control. So um, they have been spared the additional problem of uh, a, a major COVID pandemic on top of everything else, at least so far, as far as we know. That's not to say things might not change or things might not be different in the future, um, but, but so please God, um, the, the level of infection continues to be low in Northern Iraq uh, and doesn't become an additional problem uh, to add to all of those that they face. Uh, yeah, well, that's, uh, that's very good to hear. Um, yeah, no, uh, excellent, in interesting, I suppose, how, how sometimes, um, as you say, sort of a unique geography or, or, or even um, separation between communities uh, <laughs> actually, actually uh, t t turns out to help in, in some situations. Um, just read out, we, we've just had, we have, 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 have one question, uh, a comment so far, uh, please do feel free to, to, to add to that on the chat if you'd like to. Question, um, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll read out from, uh, from, from Fleur. Um, uh, who, of, of course, uh, st starts John by, by by thanking you uh, very very much for your for your uh, for your talk. Um, and Flo wonders um, how, when we're reflecting on the persecution of of Christians, um, we we should read um, texts in the Bible, uh, in, even in the New Testament, which. Um, sometimes sound um, quite quite violent um, uh, and in particular uh, Fleur highlights uh, Matthew 10 th verse 34 where Jesus said that he had not come to bring peace but but the sword um, can, can, can you can you can you give us a, a any way in which we, we might we might think think through that verse in, in light of the modern day exp experience of, of, of persecution of Christians John Yes, yeah, it's an interesting question. I, I think when, when Jesus is talking about things like not bringing peace but a sword, um, we, we have to place it in, in that great tradition of hyperbole, um, which was very common within um, uh, you know, the, the speech of the region at the time, um, that there was no understatement by, by half. You know, and, and this sort of I, 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 you know, permeates the parables. You know, if your eye offends you, pluck it out. You know, if there's a problem with your hand, cut it off. You know, there's no half measures there. It's, it's this, this, this rhetoric, this talk of going all the way. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think this talk of, you know, bringing a sword, um, again, it's this, it's this, this usage of the, the rhetorical hyperbole. It's saying that, that there's no half measures. Um, and personally, and I, I'm no great biblical scholar, um, uh, despite having studied theology, I, you know, the, the New Testament and the Old Testament wasn't my, my field of speciality. Um, but, but certainly my, my own reading of that isn't that this is a symbol of violence. Uh, my own reading of that is that this is a symbol of, you know, there cannot be compromise with the standards of the world. You know, that there has to be uh, a sense that if, if the world says, you know, um, sacrifice to idols, um, we must take the position of not sacrificing to idols. Um, uh, you know, our, our, our defence, our, our battle, our struggle um, with, with the powers, with the principalities, uh, with the forces, not just of the heavenly places, uh, but on earth as well, uh, must be a, a battle that's fought and fought with all our hearts. Um, and I, I'd see personally myself the, the rhetoric of, of, you know, Jesus bringing a sword in that context. You know, we have to give it our all, we have to be completely committed, and we have to be 100% committed to the battle. Um, I don't see it, though, as in any way a sort of um, a encouragement to violence. And, and indeed, that the church has a, a long tradition of pacifism and indeed a, a long tradition of, um, uh, you know, very carefully qualifying the circumstances upon which um, armed conflict is permissible. Uh, thinking of Thomas Aquinas's great theory of a just war, saying that there are certain circumstances in which it might be a greater evil not to fight than it would be to fight. 
um, but, but those are going to be certain defined circumstances um, and that, that generally uh, that message of peace, which is also uh, a message that, that Jesus did come to bring, um, that quotation from the Bible notwithstanding, um, and, and, and that tradition of peace, I think something we, we find in the church fathers, who of course are always our authoritative interpreters of scripture, um, and, and they do see this very specific view uh, of, of Christianity as being the authentic one. Yes, no, thanks. Thanks very, uh, thanks very much for, for that, uh, John. Um, and of course, um, of course, uh, it sounds as if on the, on the whole, you were saying in the talk, we've had, um, had uh, sort of positive, positive news or positive outcomes um, more, more recently for some of the the, uh, the Christians in Iraq. Uh, I mean, of course, we should um, all remember that, you know, persecution of Christians is uh, an ongoing going problem uh, th throughout, throughout the Middle East um, um, uh, and, and many other parts of the world. Um, notice that um, Shaquille, who I, who I said was joining us from uh, from the United States, in 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 the the chat, I uh, has posted sort of some uh, some so some less encouraging news about um, uh, I think a, a friend of his his brother um, receiving the the death sentence in in Pakistan. I think you can find out uh, more about in the chat. But I just thought I'd I'd highlight his uh, his 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 comment there. I think he's le he's left his email in case anybody wants to get get in touch and find out more about that. Um, so anybody, if, if anybody does have any more more questions, they can ask, ask them in the chat. I'll I'll just ask uh, John 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 one one more of my of my own. Um, I suppose. Building on um, Fleur's question there um, um, uh, about man, uh, Matthew ten thirty four, of course, that that verse. Um, well, immediately after that verse, Jesus perhaps offers something of an explanation as as to what he's saying, um, although perhaps not not an easy one to hear about how he's he's come to sort of, um, in a sense, divide communities or or even families, um, perhaps by their by their response to to, to, to his gospel, um, he says rather rather dramatically um, in the next verse, verse thirty five. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter in law against her mother in law, um, and so on. Well, I suppose perhaps <laughs> perhaps turning a, a daughter in law against her mother in law isn't always <laughs> so, so so difficult. I don't know what <laughs> people's experiences are there. Um, but this sort of, um, did, did, did raise a question in in my mind, which was um, about uh, perhaps a difficult question about about the the solidarity of the community or how communities as a whole um, react to, to persecution. That there's the famous quotation people might often think of when they hear about Christian persecution is um, from, from Tertullian, you know, um, or perhaps it's I remember if it's in Tertullian, you know, the, the blood of the martyrs is. is uh, is the seat of the church. I, mean, I remember when I was um, I was studying patristics and early Christian persecution. My teacher actually said that, that he thought that was probably wrong. And on the whole, when Christians were persecuted um, in the ancient world, uh, th their Roman contemporaries sort of um, viewed any resistance to persecution as a kind of matter of sort of strange fanaticism rather than something um, to, to be admired or, or emulated. And so I, I guess what, what sorry, so a friend of mine was saying. What I'm wondering is how do does the, the whole community, and I suppose people outside the Christian community in Iraq, how, how have they responded to, to the persecution of Christians? Obviously, you, you said that um, some Christians at least have um, perhaps even grown in faith or, 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 or deepened their faith in a certain way, really feeling that Christ was with them in their suffering. But I'm wondering, has that been a universal experience? How, how, have communities some, sometimes been divided by, by the sword in that sense? Or, uh, again, how, how have outsiders reacted to uh, to the, the experience of Christian persecution for a very long. I, 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 yes, I mean, it's interesting. We, we, by, by, we have done some surveys among the Iraqi Christian communities, um, by and large, on, on questions of return and, and questions of what their concerns are. Um, and that there is a, a mixture of, of, you know, those that feel the air is secure, those that feel the air isn't secure, and some of the issues I was listing at the end. Um, are actually taken from the last survey we did 
um, when Christians said what they felt, you know, whether they felt there was a future, whether they felt there wasn't a future, um, and what the issues were that, that faced them. Um, we haven't really, by and large, um, ca carried out surveys of, of attitudes such as hope. Um, but, but I think it's always surprising that when you speak to people, um, that there is such a positive attitude. Um, I, I remember once, e even before the Esh season in the planes, um, uh, you know, th there were a number of waves of attacks in Mosul when Christians were driven out. Uh, I remember in Lebanon meeting with some Iraqi refugees, um, and, and they were all very upbeat, um, speaking about their faith, speaking about you know their, their prayer life, speaking about their trust in God. And I, I remember saying to one of my colleagues I was with, if I had been in that situation, I'm not sure I, I'd have been given that sort of positive message. Um, I, I have been surprised by the reaction I've got, um, this message of hope. Um, I've been constantly surprised. I mean, let, let's speak about the, the two sisters whose father George was martyred. Um, I, I mean, yeah, I, I, I was in tears when I was interviewing them, and, and they, they were in tears when, when this strange guy from Aid to the Church in Need, um, you know, it, it intruded on their lives and, and, and asked them about possibly the most harrowing hours of their life they'd ever had to live, to, live through. Um, but the fact that despite all of that, there is this message of hope, um, I, I just find it humbling. I find it deeply humbling. Um, I, on, I, I, I want to say I find it perplexing, but on, on one level, I don't find it perplexing because I, I understand where they're coming from and I understand what they're saying. Um, but on, on an emotional level, um, I, I think I'd probably be a lot more angry and a lot more you know, furious with God. I'd be a bit more like Job in, in that if, if life dealt me that sort of hand. Um, I, I very much doubt I'd be speaking about hope and about all those other things. Um, so, yeah, I, I find it deeply surprising that that's the reaction I've got from people I've interviewed. That's the reaction colleagues have got. Um, as I say, it, it's not a statistical thing by any means, um, but it, it, it is quite, I, I find it quite incredible. Yeah, really, really incredible um, and a sign of God's, God's great grace, I think, um, uh, even in times of, of persecution. Um, uh, a question from, uh, from, from John. Uh, John wonders um, whether perhaps, perhaps if, if persecution can, can yield this sort of spiritual fruit, um, whether sort of, do, do we think that sort of some sort of, some level of persecution is even, is even necessary for, for Christian faith? Uh, will, will our faith kind of, kind of weaken or, 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 or degrade without it? Um, or, or perhaps, do, is that all the right way to think, to think about these, these things? What do you think, John? I, 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 think, I think I'd hesitate to say that persecution is a, a necessary um, a component of, of authentic Christian living. I, I think it's fair to say, though, that sometimes in the West, we can get very complacent. We can take things in our stride. Um, we think, well, okay, during COVID lockdown, perhaps not. But before the COVID lockdown, you know, we, we could go to church on Sunday. We, we took it for granted. Um, wh whereas, for example, if you've been in somewhere like Pakistan and you've had your church burnt down, um, you can't take it for granted. Um, so I, I, I think there is a sense that when a faith group is under attack, when Christians are being persecuted, they value their faith more because they value what they've got, because they know that it's not necessarily going to be there. And, and that in some ways it is a blessing and a grace to have things that, that we might in the West take for granted. Um, and to be honest, we, we shouldn't take them for granted. Um, I, I think what one of the, the, the great lessons perhaps that the persecuted church can teach us is that many of the, the trappings of our faith, many of the things that, you know, we, we do take for granted. And, and yes, you know, we, we have lost access to, to Mass on Sunday um, uh, to, to, to a large, lesser or greater degree with the COVID lockdown. Um, but co compared to what some people have, have faced throughout the world, you know, we, we don't go to, uh, to, to an evening service uh, with any fear that it's going to be attacked by extremists in suicide vests. Um, so, yeah, 
yes, I, I obviously where, where there is persecution, that there, there is a renewed sense of the value of the faith. Um, I don't think that necessarily means that it's necessary for the faith to flourish. I, I think that the faith can flourish in many ways. Um, I, I do think that we do sometimes need to shake ourselves out of our complacency. Um, you know, I think Pope Francis has, has been one of the things he's been very good at during his, his pontificate is trying to shake people out of their complacency um, to, to live an authentic Christian life um, and to, to, to see, you know, the, the value of the faith we've got and the value of authentically living it out, which is extremely difficult, um, but, but no more difficult for us in, in the West than for people in the Middle East. Um, it's just I think that there's more of a temptation to, to back burner it and do, do it next week over here. Um, whereas when you've got that that visceral reality, um, you know, you, you know the value of the faith. And just to pick up on the, the previous point that was mentioned about Pakistan, um, you know, there are Christians today and indeed members of other religious minority groups who have been accused of making blasphemous remarks. The probability are that in most of their cases that they haven't issued blasphemous remarks and it's being used as a, a way of evening scores within the community. It's interesting time and time again, as with the case of Asia Bibi, there was a whole context that underlay uh, the, the, the charge of blasphemy against her. There had been tensions between her and one of the families in the village from which the accusation came. And time and time again, when you look at these blasphemy accusations, um, you find it's a case that th there's very little substantial evidence and really the cases should have been thrown out. Um, but because feelings run high, often the judges are afraid uh, to be seen. It almost becomes a case of taking sides. They don't want to be seen as taking sides um, with someone that's blasphemed uh, against the, the majority religion. Um, and that is a problem. But that there are people on death row today in Pakistan who have been accused of nothing more than having uttered blasphemous remarks. Um, Another problem in Pakistan, which affects the, the sort of border states, um, Sindh and the Punjab, uh, there is the problem of girls from both the Christian and Hindu communities um, being abducted, um, being forcibly married, um, and being forced to convert from Christianity to the religion of their husband. Um, and when I say forcibly married, we are, we are talking, we're talking sexual violence. We, we're, we're not you know, we are talking very nasty experiences. And according to one estimate, we're looking about a thousand cases of, of women being abducted every year. Um, now, that may well be a, a figure that fluctuates. It may well be that's at the higher end, the thousand. But let's say at a conservative figure, we are looking at 300 cases every year of girls being kidnapped from these communities. The first thing to say is that's 300 too many. And if anything in the West, we, we should be fired up. You know, if, if we are Christians, we should be fired up because members of our co-religionists are being abducted. Even if we are not Christians, though, surely we should be fired up by the fact that somebody from a minority group has been abducted for nothing more than the fact that because of their religion, because of their social status, they are in a vulnerable group. And they have been abducted and put through that process of, of forced marriage and forced marriage as I say is often a synonym for, for much worse forms of sexual violence against these women um, and there are a number of cases which we are following at the moment um, Myra Shabazz is one of them um, thank god um, she managed to escape her abductor's house within the last month um, but but she she was abducted at gunpoint during a covid lockdown uh, she was whisked off. Um, there were various challenges in court. Um, her lawyer thought that the evidence in her defence was watertight. Um, there is a marriage act in Sindh province uh, that says that if you're under age, you can't get married exactly to address these sorts of cases. Um, and that was pretty much thrown out um, on the grounds that her abductor said she was 19. Her birth certificate said she was 13 at the time of the abduction. No way was she 19. Um, and time and time again in court, she was being sent back to her abductor. Um, sh she was in tears, poor lass. The family was in tears. Her mother had a heart attack at one of the trials when it went against her. Um, and th there is an on-legal battle at the moment to keep her free from her abductor. 
And to return to the original point, if you are living in a community where that's happening to, to your brothers and sisters, if you are living in a community where that is happening to members of your faith, yes, there is going to be a sense that you are a faith under fire and there is going to be a sense of valuing, I think, more preciously and more dearly the beauty of what's being passed down to you. Um, and, and certainly that is the case of the Christian community. I don't know what the situation is in the Hindu community in those regions. It may well be the same case for them. But the fact that, you know, the Christians and the Hindus are vulnerable minorities um, is, and the fact that's being exploited by members of the majority community is, it's galling. And it's something, I, I, I say that we, we can be complacent about our faith in the West. Our founder, a to the Church and his founder, Father Bromfrid von Stratton, um, once said, they are being tested in faith, which is paradoxical, given, I, you know, to, to, to some degree, as I, I've said, that their faith seems to be strengthened. But his, his view was that in the challenges they faced, they were being tested in faith. He said, we're being tested in love, in our response to those situations, in our love for those people who are suffering, in making their cases better known, in cases like those who are in prison because of the blasphemy law or those who are abducted. Um, and back when we had the problems in Iraq, you know, in practical ways, um, when I say that 40% of the help came from aid to the church in need, um, you know, in a way that's not really true. 40% of the help came from aid to the church in need's benefactors, the ordinary people in the pew whose hearts were touched, whose hearts went out to those living in a, a displacement situation, and, and who helped um, their, their suffering brothers and sisters at a time when it seemed that by and large the world had turned their back, uh, when it seemed that most Western countries, actually no, po Poland and, and Hungary, they're, they're pretty much Eastern, Eastern Europe. Okay. When, when factually, Western countries have pretty much turned their back and were not helping. It's true today to say that after a very long struggle on behalf of the, the Iraqi churches, um, that USAID has started to give some help for job creation programs and other infrastructure type projects. Um, and full credit to them for having responded and done that. But I, I know that the, the gentleman from the Chaldean church that, that led that push and led that initiative, yeah, it was a lot of meetings, it was a lot of flights over there, it was a lot of, you know, speaking to politicians, speaking to people in, in USAID that actually got that money delivered. Um, it wasn't a case, so sometimes people think that the, the current American administration is quite sympathetic uh, to the cause of Christians because of, of where they're placed politically, um, and certainly in, in the talk they give, you'd think they were, but it was still an uphill struggle under the current administration uh, to get that aid out of them on behalf of the Chaldean church. Um, so apologies if that's a bit of a wandering answer and apologies if that's become a, a bit of a soapbox, um, you know, touching on, on two things very close to my heart. One, the, the fact that these communities can feel abandoned by the rest of the world. And, and two, the fact that these communities can suffer terrible things. Um, and, and seemingly, you know, the very few people are speaking up for us. Um, for, for, for them. Um, yes, uh, apologies yeah, the, for animated, but it's, it's no, heartfelt. No, 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 indeed. Uh, th thanks so much for that, John. I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, raise one, and I've uh, gone slightly over, over, over our lot of time, but I'll, I'll just, um, I'll just ask, ask one, one final question, which, which Helen had uh, before we end, but I should, should say that, um, uh, the, 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 just uh, in pride to what you've just been saying, John, Shaquille, uh, Pal Passes on his his thanks and also to aid to Church and to Igala have been providing uh, he says have been providing some legal support for for his his brother uh, Nadim who's likewise I think been been accused of, of, of blasphemy that's that's right Sh Shaquille in in Pakistan um Hel Helen's question though um is is just sort of a question kind of picking up um on that um question of of our response to uh, to persecution and H Helen wonders um, wonders whether in your experience the, those those Christians who, who have been persecuted um, are able to 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 forgive um, pe the people who, who who've, who've done this to them. She suggests that many of us might find it that that, that very difficult, and so she wonders how uh, how the Christians who who you've met 
deal deal with that issue again in, in in the same way that i'm humbled by the hope and the faith that i see um I, i've always been also been humbled by the capacity to forgive um and again as i said earlier i i'm not sure in that situation whether i would be able to forgive myself um or, or you know, whether i myself be able to forgive having lived through some of the things that they've seen um but a, a number of them who have been through absolutely horrific horrific situations um which i, I won't mention some of them are i think too, too horrific to, to be mentioned in, in in this um sort of uh, forum but but think of some of the most horrific things you can think of um and, and i've heard people who have been through those situations have those things happen to their loved ones uh, still speak of, of their ability to be able to, to forgive um, the, the people who have done this. And, and actually, I, I'm reminded of, of something Oscar Wilde wrote. He, he wrote, I think it was in De Profundis, um, he's, he wrote paradoxically that forgiveness isn't necessarily so much about something for the other person, it's about something for ourselves. Um, that, that if we, we hold on to that hate, if we hold on to, and this is paraphrasing what he said, he didn't actually say this, but if, if we hold on to, to that hate, if we hold on to that, that sense of, of unforgiveness, it can mar our souls and it can restrict our spiritual development. Whereas forgiveness is, if you like, a way of releasing that and, and setting us free to grow spiritually again. Um, and I'm sure he's very true, uh, but equally on an emotional level, I'm sure it's also very difficult. Uh, and when I hear people being able to say, even in tears, that they have forgiven, you know, that they are obviously walking a spiritual path towards healing and renewal from those terrible things that they have undergone. Um, and I, I think that they probably have more courage than I do in being able to, um, uh, to, to take those steps. Um, yeah I, the, the, these people's faith it, it, it is humbling what, what what more can i say um they are they, as you know i i described george that was killed in the, the our lady of salvation and syriac catholic church uh, a martyr he yes th th this man went went to pray this man was killed purely because of his faith by, by every definition he, he is a martyr um but but to see relatives being able to forgive, seeing relatives being able to, to, to acknowledge that pain, acknowledge that event and, and move on. Um, I, I personally think there is something more than human, that there is something supernatural uh, and there is something of, of the grace of God there. Um, and, and that grace of God, as we believe as Catholics, infuses the whole world and is given to everybody. Uh, but hopefully, as, as those who have um, been baptised into the mystical body of Christ, we, we are more attuned to it uh, and we are able to, to use it as, as a living and a real force in our lives. And, and certainly my observation would be from many of those I speak to in the Middle East and elsewhere, they are certainly open to it and they are certainly um, living that, that grace of God as a, as a real and living force in their lives.